We're interrupting programmes to tell you that Diana, Princess of Wales, is gravely ill in intensive care in Paris's Salpetriere Hospital after being seriously injured in a car crash which killed her friend, the Haradair Dodi fire. The car is still in the tunnel where it crashed. The accident happened shortly after midnight. Diana and her friend Dodi al Fayed have been dining at the Ritz Hotel and we have just received um, news from the press association that in fact her injuries may be more serious, perhaps much more serious than we had imagined beforehand. Policemen clear the way for the princess 17 million pounds richer after her divorce deal. She had everything to live for in that last tragic summer. She was out there having fun. Nar Fayed's multi-million pound yacht. Tonight, another royal controversy sparkles. Not only was he known as a playboy, but he was engaged to somebody else. She looks really quite sexy, but then she's a single woman in her 30s. Why not? falling in love with a doctor and a heart surgeon to boot. I mean, it's astonishing. Diana was divorced. Was Diana going to marry Dodie Fire? This was front page tabloid news. She was alone. She shouldn't have been there alone. I remember being asked to watch a very harrowing tape, and I thought, I know that look. She was not happy. It was the perfect storm, and it ended in tragedy. If there was no money in the photographs, they would have been after her in the tunnel. In your own time, gracefully. Right. No, there, there isn't going to be an announcement. There is a, there is a, there is a statement which is being faxed to the press association, but it's not going to be read out. Hold them out, love me. Almost exactly a year to the day before her death, Diana, Princess of Wales, finalises her divorce with Prince Charles. Come right out. Policemen clear the way for the princess this evening as she leaves a London hotel. Grim-faced, but £17 million richer after her divorce deal, ITN has learned authoritatively. A lot of water had gone under the bridge between Charles and Diana. All the unhappiness, all the war of the Waleses, all the book writing and the television interviews and things, all, all of that was over. Diana never wanted a divorce. Uh, she told me that when we were together at the palace and she was saying it's not what I'm looking for at all. And after that, I think she began to put her life together again. She looked fit, she looked great. She was an international celebrity on the world stage. Let me put it this way. I thought she was a kind of uh, a cross between Cindy Crawford and Mother Teresa. She looked a million dollars in her, in her beautiful clothes. Uh, but she had the compassion of a nun. She became an absolute global superstar. She even had folk like a certain Donald Trump trying to date her. Diana's divorce settlement allows her to remain in Kensington Palace. She maintains an office, but no longer has access to a full team of royal staff. Diana was downsizing. She was still living in apartments eight and nine at Kensington Palace. But now she had to pay for her own staff. Suddenly, people started to disappear. And in the end, there were very few people left. There was me, the chef, and a part-time dresser. And that was it. She jettisoned her bodyguards, uh, which was not a good idea, actually, her protection officers. And she said, I went downstairs to get in the car the other day and there was no petrol in it. Um, and, and I'd quite forgotten you got to fill, fill your car up with petrol. So she was learning a, a new way of existing. I think any woman who finds herself uh, divorced at that stage of her life, mid-30s, you know, you've, you've got to learn to stand on your two feet. Diana firmly believed that something special would happen that a role would be given to her, that she could continue in a new life and represent her country. That was important to her. Diana's search for a new role comes at a time when Britain is also seeking a new future. Labour Party, 20,000 A victorious Labour Prime Minister at the gates of Downing Street and a piece of political history. This was simply unprecedented. New Labour under Tony Blair win the general election.
our big message was modernization. The one thing that I think people thought about Princess Diana is that she was a very modern reflection of where she came from. And I think what she knew was that she had this ability to cut through. I think she was interested in a very kind of loose, informal way, her role in, as, a, as a kind of ambassador for Britain. And I remember at one point, I think I wrote this in my diary, that Tony couldn't decide whether to flirt or be a statesman. Now, always a crowd puller of exceptional power, she seeks some sort of ambassadorial role linked to charitable concerns. Diana may have a long-term game plan, but this doesn't stop her getting to work on causes closest to her heart. One of the chosen few charities is the English National Ballet. When the princess attends its annual gala, the world gets its first glimpse of the new single Diana. As a young girl, she'd wanted to be a ballet dancer, but had grown too tall. And so this was a rather special event. She turns up, she watches it. It's full of, you know, well-known people in the ballet world. Um, but she loved it because it was something she wanted to do. And she looks really quite sexy. But then she's a single woman in her 30s. Why not? She wanted to break away in part from her old life find new challenges, um, you know, and, and, make it, and make a change, turn the page, if you like. But the new Diana is more than a philanthropic force. From ballet to battlefields, nine days after the London Gala, she brings landmines to international attention. I am not a political figure. And as I said at the time, and I'd like to reiterate now, my interests are humanitarian. Five days later, Diana takes this message across the world. She was lauded at ceremonies in New York. Um, she went to the White House and met Hillary Clinton to discuss her landmines campaign. There are said, ladies and gentlemen, to be around 110 million landmines undetected in the world. And, and all the time you felt she was sort of shedding her past in order to prepare for her future. She was a great ambassador for Britain. People loved her, they flocked to her, and she took the brand of the British monarchy and of Britain itself across the world. Even living saints need the princess. Mother Teresa, who was terminally ill by this time, invites Diana to her missionary of charity convent in the Bronx. Even when the royals abandoned her, she was still probably our number one ambassador. She was a woman who had everything. She had beauty, she had money, she had power, she had influence. Anybody in the world she wanted to meet, they wanted to meet her, Mother Teresa, whoever it was. This eight-day trip to the States sees Diana operating on her own, without royal security, casting off the symbols of her old life. This unprecedented... There had never been a sale quite like it, and no one had dared speculate how much this American audience would spend. I think once the trappings of royalty, including her own title, HRH, were taken away from her, she felt maybe that she should get rid of a whole lot of other things in her life. And so suddenly we heard that she was going to auction all these fantastic gowns that uh, she'd been given over the years. She said, come on down to the wardrobe room with me. And she had a room as big as most people's sitting rooms, covered with wardrobes all the way around. And all her clothes were in colour coordination from white right the way around the room to black. So she flung open all the doors and picked out one dress one by one and told me the story behind it and said, oh, this is the one I wore at the White House. Do you remember me dancing with John Travolta? Put that on the rail. Oh, and this one, this is an old friend. Do you remember when Charles danced, danced with me? Oh, I do remember this one. That can go as well. Until the whole wardrobe was empty. The new Diana takes a huge gamble. Will interest in the old Diana be enough to bring in the big spenders? At 70,000. 75,000. From the very first lot, it was clear there were some big checkbooks in the room. Not two, the dress the princess wore the night her husband admitted his adultery went for almost as much. $65,000. 
Utah. I went to the auction in, uh, in New York, I think it was, um, and it was it was fantastic to see uh, the figures that these these dresses fetch. You know, thousands and tens of thousands of pounds. But the best was to be the dress in which she met the Reagan and then danced with John Travolta. Two hundred thousand last time. Yours, one hundred and twenty thousand pounds for a single dress. And I think it was it was more than just raising money for charity. It was a, a clearing out of her old life and a, a thought of how things were going to be different in the future. Many buyers were far from sure what they'd do with them. We're going to frame it, put it on loan to museum. Oh no, she's going to let me wear it. She's going to let me wear it. We have no idea what we're going to do with it yet, but we'll think of something. Whatever their reasons, they contributed enormous sums to AIDS and cancer charities, sums that can't fail to have pleased the princess herself. After raising more than three and a half million pounds for charity, Diana appears happier than ever. But behind the scenes, there's real turmoil. A two-year secret affair is collapsing, and her life is about to spiral out of control. Diana celebrates her 36th birthday at the Tate Gallery in London. The gallery was opened in 1897 by the then Princess of Wales. Today's princess seemed very cheerful on this, her first birthday since her divorce. The guest list reflects not just the cream of London society, but also the greatest names in British cool and Hollywood glamour. She was making new friends, her traditional friends, the sort of aristocratic type of, of people that she'd grown up with were being replaced by celebrities. There was Elton John, there was Versace. David Bowie's wife was there, Steve Martin, some, you know, Hollywood glitterati, as well as a few members of the, of the royal family. It was a big event, 500 people, I think. And she looked absolutely stunning. I mean, she was dressed to kill. But for Diana, there is one guest in this star-studded reception who is conspicuous by his absence an eminent heart surgeon called Hasnat Khan. There have been rumours for quite a long time that Diana was in love with, with a heart surgeon, but nobody knew quite who um, or whether it was true. In 1996, Diana developed an obsession for heart surgery. She received much criticism for allowing a film crew to follow her into the operating theatre. I remember her telling me once when I was at the palace that she loved to go and watch heart surgery, open heart surgery at the Brompton Hospital. And recently I've had more opportunities to go into theatres and see for myself what the wonderful work the doctors and nurses do. Well, you gather information much more from the visual contact rather than reading books, I find. So when I stand up and speak about the various subjects, whatever it is, I find it more beneficial if I've actually seen it. She said, oh, the heart, it's so important, Jenny, isn't it? The heart, it means everything. But there were other matters of the heart at stake too. Diana was secretly dating one of the surgeons. She was enormously attracted to Hasnut. He was a kind, really solid bloke. And he did this most amazing work. There's something slightly Mills and Boons, if you like, about a, a, a young woman falling in love with a doctor and a heart surgeon to boot. I mean, there was Diana who wanted to be the queen of hearts, and there was Hasnut Khan, the man who mended broken hearts. But on the face of it, Hasnut Khan was unlikely boyfriend material. Here's Diana, working out, eating healthily, and there's heart surgeon Hasnat Khan, drinking Coke, eating burgers, overweight, not working out. I mean, it's astonishing. Only Diana's closest inner circle knew about the relationship. I would bring him into Kensington Palace in the boot of my car or underneath a blanket on the back seat of my car. The police never stopped me. I'd take him in the back entrance. It was a bit of an adventure. She put on wigs, uh, dressed up, and they went to jazz clubs in Soho. She loved that kind of subterfuge and the fact that the mass media, the paparazzi, knew nothing about it. That was all part of the delicious charm of Hasnut Khan. So from there on, their romance blossomed, and she met him on dates outside of the palace too. Hasnut Khan, he just had no pretensions. He wasn't interested in fame or what He couldn't give a damn that she was a princess. He just liked her. And uh, I think she found that absolutely endearing. But however clandestine, 
a love affair between the Princess of Wales and a Pakistani heart surgeon could never remain secret forever. Sir James Goldsmith lent his Boeing 757 to daughter Jemima and the Princess of Wales to fly them direct to Lahore. On a tour of Pakistan six weeks before her birthday, Diana took time out to secretly meet her lover's parents at their family home. The media pounced. The Princess of Wales was giving nothing away about her secret overnight meeting. She slipped out to meet the mother and father and other relatives of close friend Dr. Hasnet Khan. But despite reports of romance, the father of the London-based heart specialist said the princess was a good friend, not a girlfriend of his son. But just the confirmation of a close friendship caused huge consternation in Fleet Street. The idea that the Princess of Wales, as was, was going to marry a doctor from Pakistan and perhaps go and live with him in Pakistan. This was just not what we were expecting. She'd had long conversations with Jemima Khan, who had actually married Imran Khan. And I think Diana was wondering if it was something she could do. But the press attention had rocked the foundations of the two-year-old romance. He didn't want anything to do with the hullabaloo. He wanted to just be a heart surgeon, and, uh, uh, and I can understand that. And so, you know, it's difficult for someone like Princess Diana, like any superstar, to form uh, a relationship where the, the other person in the relationship would continually come under a microscope. Reportedly a week after the celebrity birthday bash, Diana and Khan have a row at a secret Hyde Park meeting. She once again faces rejection by a love of her life. She told me, no one will want me, no one will want the baggage I come with. And in the end, she was right, because he felt he didn't want to live in that kind of goldfish bowl with that kind of limelight. His world was so utterly different from Diana's, and um, it was very hard to see how he could be her plus one and she could be the wife of a hospital doctor. With her relationship on the rocks, Diana's summer is about to spiral out of control. Just two days later, she finds herself tackling another major dilemma in her personal life. Diana's big problem after the separation from Prince Charles was what to do with the boys during the summer. Where to take them, what to do. Since the princess gave up her royal protection officers, options are limited. She needs a location that provides both privacy and security. Help comes from an unexpected quarter. Mohammed al Fayed was a fixture for the royal family. His stool, Harrods, was patronised by members of the royal family in their circle. He was very friendly with the royal family at that time and even used to sponsor their events. Mohammed al Fayed said, look, you love the south of France, you'll love the heat, you'll be on a boat, you'll be well away from everybody. And she thought, why not? So when Diana asked the Queen if she could take William and Harry down to the south of France, then it was just simply waved through. Diana and her boys take the Harrods private jet to Al Fayed's villa in Saint-Tropez. But the press are onto them and start to question her choice of host. Mohammed Al Fayed's multi-million pound yacht, moored here on the French Riviera, resort to the very rich, where tonight another royal controversy sparkles. The photograph which has incensed some MPs. Diana, Princess of Wales, arm in arm with the Harrods boss on board his yacht. The Saint-Tropez villa of Diana's friend Mohammed Al Fayed. In full view of waiting press and TV cameras, the princess went to the beach beside it today. She seemed unconcerned by all the attention. The press are having a long lens field day. They were swimming a lot together, they were on the jet skis, they were going off on the yacht somewhere for the day. They had a fun time. I mean, it was the life that the rich and famous enjoy all the time on holiday, and she was getting some of it. But Diana becomes increasingly irritated by the press intrusion and starts to cryptically toy with reporters. Seeking out British journalists on a boat they'd hired, she was widely reported as telling them, you are going to get a big surprise with the next thing I do. My sons are always urging me to live abroad. Maybe that's what I should do. The irony is that William has since remarked that that time in the south of France was the worst week's holiday of his life. With the holiday threatening to sour, Al Fayed, keen to keep the good times rolling, makes a call to his eldest son, Dodie. 
Dodie's down the coast with his fiance. Uh, she's a model, they plan to marry, and he leaves her languishing on his yacht, goes off to his dad's yacht, starts making cow eyes at Diana. He was known as a, as a playboy. Not only was he known as a playboy, but he was engaged to somebody else at that time. So you thought, what on earth is going on here? When Dodie jumps ship, he leaves his supermodel girlfriend, Kelly Fisher, high and dry. She believes they're engaged, and a month later files a lawsuit for breach of contract. Miss Fisher loved, trusted, and believed in Mr. Fayette. In return, he took her love, and he gave every indication that they were going to get married, and that he would fulfill all of his promises to her. Paparazzi images of Diana with Dodie are now appearing all over the world. Back in London, Paul Burrell is holding the fort and facing the music for Diana's increasingly tangled love life. Every time the princess rang me, she'd ask about Hasnett. Have you seen him? Have you been to his pub? What did he say? Has he seen the pictures in the papers? What did he think? Is he jealous? Hasnett was furious that, that Diana could turn to someone like Dodi al -Fayed, um, the, the son of a, a multimillionaire and a playboy. That wasn't Diana. He knew that wasn't his Diana. In the middle of all this for all, Diana receives devastating news from across the Atlantic. Graphic reports covering the murder of one of her closest friends start coming in. Gianni Versace enjoyed worldwide fame and extraordinary wealth, but this morning it wasn't enough to stop him suffering a brutal and squalid death on his own doorstep. He was in the process of opening the gate when he was approached by uh, a white male, perhaps 25 years old. We're told that apparently shot him at point blank range. This is a spot where Gianni Versace was gunned down in cold blood yesterday morning. The flowers here are covering up blood stains on the steps. It couldn't be a greater contrast between this glamorous location in Miami and this cold-blooded act of murder. Five days after the death of the international fashion designer, a devastated Diana returns William and Harry to the UK. The boys travel up to Balmoral to spend a month with their father. For photographers, it was a welcome relief. Many of them would have spent the summer crawling through the heather to get their picture. This year, the picture came to them. The next day, Diana flies from London to Milan for Versace's memorial service. Throughout the city, people came together to pay a last tribute to one of the world's best fashion designers. The Princess of Wales, a Versace devotee, said she was devastated by his death. She made her way to the front row, sitting between two stars from the world of music, Elton John on her left, Sting on her right. It deeply moved her. This was only months before she'd die herself. And here she was, sat at Gianni's funeral. She couldn't quite comprehend it. Death seemed to haunt her towards the end of her life. She was so consumed by thinking it might happen to her. The next time many of Diana's celebrity friends will be together would be at her own funeral. Diana is back in London after attending the memorial service for Gianni Versace five days previously. Her boys are up in Scotland holidaying with their father. Prince Charles sported his Lord of the Isles tartan while all eyes were on his eldest camera shy son. Home alone, Diana holds another secret meeting with Hasnat Khan, her lover of two years, this time in Battersea Park. They had a screaming match late one night. They shouted and screamed at each other, and neither one of them gave in. And so she ended the relationship. You know, I don't know whether it actually broke her heart, but it really upset her. According to Khan, the couple spent the next night together at Diana's apartment. But this was the final breakup, and the last time they saw each other. With Diana's love life spiralling out of control, her schedule is about to follow suit. Within 24 hours of the split with Khan, she's on a plane to Sardinia. Mohammed Al-Fayed had bought a, a yacht which could be at their disposal. 
the Jonicle. So Diana then returned to the Mediterranean alone to resume her friendship with Dodi al -Fayed. So the romance was in full acceleration. It was full on pace and it was accelerating beyond control. Once again, the press are one step ahead. She was probably the most famous person on the planet at that time, certainly the most photographed, and that wasn't gonna disappear, unfortunately, for her. The press pack will spend the next five days chasing Al Fayed's multi-million pound luxury yacht around the Mediterranean. Where is she? Look at that. The feeding frenzy to get the first photographic evidence of a romance between Diana and Dodie is unprecedented. And I think she definitely reached this point where a lot of the media stop actually thinking that they're human beings. She became a thing rather than a person for a lot of people, I think. The sense that she's not really a person, you can kick her about as much as you want. I mean, boatloads of uh, photographers and reporters. It was just huge. I mean, paparazzi from all over Europe were there. She became more vulnerable. The paparazzi took more liberties. It takes less than a day for the paparazzi to start striking tabloid gold. Today, though, more pictures appeared of her on holiday with the millionaire Dodie Fayed. Three British newspapers have paid half a million pounds for them. Diana and Dodie are captured in a compromising clinch that becomes the iconic image of their summer romance. They have the full run of the boat as Mohammed Al Fayed has returned to London. Dodi Al Fayed himself hasn't been seen today, but his father was watching Fulham, his latest acquisition, in action. He seemed relaxed about the pictures. It's all right. It's all right. He's in movie business. You know that's all right. Doesn't bother him. After the chaos of the cruise, Diana and Dodi returned briefly to London with the press even hotter on their heels. Tabloid photographers have laid siege to the Park Lane home of Dodi Fayed. Late last night, the arrival of a car similar to that owned by the Princess of Wales led to reports that the two were sharing an intimate meal. Frustratingly for the photographers, there was no opportunity to see the diners, although their own activities were constantly monitored by security cameras which protect this exclusive part of Mayfair. The very next day, Diana left Dodi and flew to Bosnia, but this would be no holiday. Along the runway that was once no man's land, past the trenches which saw such bitter fighting, Diana, Princess of Wales, arrived in Sarajevo. She left behind the morning's headlines to take her first steps in the capital, which encapsulates the death, horror and tragedy of civil war. Diana's extraordinarily courageous, doing what royals are not supposed to do, which was to get engaged in political issues. And um, clearly landmines was a political issue and we should have been doing something about clearing them up. And she said so and actually influenced politics as a result. Her trip to Bosnia was really important to Diana. It was part of her humanitarian mission. Uh, but it was overshadowed by her romance with Dodi. Uh, the, the mass media were just speculating, will they marry? The princess may also have been apprehensive that the large media pack following her were more interested in matters elsewhere than in the plight of Bosnians. Some came too close. Please don't, she asked. After the frustrations of Bosnia, Diana's whirlwind summer gathers even more pace. She briefly hooks up with Dodi in the UK, then five days later, jets off for a week-long Greek island cruise with girlfriend Rosa Monckton. The day Diana flies back from Greece, she's pictured having lunch with William in Kensington. It proves to be the last time they see each other. That afternoon, she flies with Dodie for a third and final trip to the south of France. The Jonakil once again tours the Mediterranean, with the paparazzi chasing her from port to port. She ends up back in Sardinia. Dodie and Diana had spent uh, a few very happy days on, on board the yacht, ha had a lot of fun together, uh, but it was time to go home. Um, the, I think they had actually extended their trip by a few days. The princess rang me from, from the boat originally and said, we've gone to be a day late. I should be coming home tomorrow, 
But Dodie has to go to Paris to do work for his father. I have to go to Paris with him because there's no other way I can get home. I'm on the Harrods jet. So bear with me, delay everything one day, ring Balmoral, tell the boys that the mummy will be with them 24 hours later than she expected, but to be there. Dodie and Diana leave Sardinia in the Alfayad family's private jet. They went via Paris because uh, his father, Mohammed Al Fayed, owned the Ritz in Paris. I think it had recently been refurbished. He quite wanted to show that off. At the 2008 inquest into Diana's death, grainy CCTV images taken near the Ritz that afternoon capture paparazzi on motorbikes lying in wait. There's a kind of hysteria that overcomes the mass media every so often. And just imagine you're Diana sitting in a limousine and the paparazzi are all around you on the road into Paris and, and some stupid scooter drivers are trying to take pictures of you. And, she, and during that madcap drive into Paris, she told Dodie, somebody will get killed. After a whistle-stop tour around the sites of Paris, Diana and Dodie arrive at the Ritz. More photographers are gathering outside. In this CCTV footage, much of which has never been seen before, they're shown entering the Ritz Hotel, crossing the lobby. They go into the lift. Diana is smiling, wearing sunglasses pushed back on her head and a cream trouser suit. They certainly seem relaxed in each other's company. Diana spends the afternoon and early evening largely holed up in the Imperial Suite. At 9.30, an attempt to go out to dinner is aborted when they're mobbed by paparazzi. Dodie loses his temper. When they return, their car is surrounded by photographers and the couple have to be protected by their bodyguards as they re-enter the Ritz. Dodie's security um, was fine for Dodie, but it wasn't high caliber enough for the princess, who was an international world figure and a member of our royal family. Diana looks furious as she comes in, and the jury heard there's evidence that Dodie was angry about the chaotic scenes and that he allegedly came up with the plan to try and outwit the paparazzi. She didn't have any security of her own, so she had to rely on his professionalism, thinking that he would be, not realizing that he wasn't. If you can have a relationship and build up a trust with your security team, then there's a chance it will work. If it breaks down, if the chemistry disappears, then it's very, very difficult. It probably wasn't the best, and they were unable to give her the privacy that she, she actually looked for. The role of the dice in the last few hours of the princess's life was just so unfortunate. Everything worked against her. Nothing was in her favor. She was in the wrong place, at the wrong time, with the wrong man. Diana, Princess of Wales, and Dodie Al Fayed are under siege in the Ritz Hotel in Paris. Over the last weeks, days, and hours, their every move chased by paparazzi. The 2008 inquest into Diana's death used CCTV to meticulously piece together a precise timeline of their final minutes. Hundreds of photographers are now gathering outside. Diana is totally reliant upon Dodie and his security team. So he phones his father and says, should we stay at the Ritz or go back to the apartment? And his father made that fateful decision, go back to the apartment. I don't quite understand why, once they were cornered, why they didn't just stay there. Mohammed Al Fayed, Dodi's father, decided that he should send a decoy car away from the front door to draw the press away and sent Dodi and, and Diana out of the back door of the Ritz. But suspecting the ruse, some of the press head to the rear exit of the hotel. And what needed here, there needed to be some dialogue with the media to find out 
what they wanted, to make arrangements with the police to organise and police the press professionally and, and efficiently and not allow them to patrol the, 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 the hotel at that time. I remember being asked to watch a very harrowing tape, one of the last tapes from the security cameras at uh, the hotel in, in Paris. And I thought, I know that look. That body language, that hunched protective stance that she was in, she was not happy. And remembering what a professional, painstaking princess she had been, the way in which um, you know, if I made a, a single mistake, she would notice it. She was very, very aware of how things should be run. You could tell from her expression, even in those last shots, she was unhappy. There was something not right. She knew when things weren't running properly, and I have a horrid feeling that she um, was already feeling unsafe. It was kind of like a pell-mell evening uh, with no rhyme or reason. Dodie is out of control uh, in terms of he doesn't know what to do, and that leads to them sl slipping out the back door of the Ritz and then getting into a, a high-powered Mercedes. It was the perfect storm. A lot of things were in play that night for one reason or another, and, and it ended in tragedy. These images, exhibited at the Court of Inquiry, are the last known of the princess. They show Diana, Dodie, and bodyguard Trevor Rhys Jones. Their driver, Henri Paul, is three times over the French drink drive limit. In just five minutes' time, they will crash in the Pont de l'Alma underpass. Yes, I was, I was just stunned that something so, um, it seems so, commonplace, if you like, someone so extraordinary and vibrant and larger than life to, to, to die in a, a car crash. She was alone. She shouldn't have been there alone. You know, I, I still curse her to this day for going all that way by yourself and not having somebody with you. The Mercedes saloon they were traveling in was no more than crumpled metal. It had careered from one side of the underpass to the other. The driver and Dodi al Fayed died at once. The security man and Diana initially both survived, though ambulance men spent two hours with her at the scene. At about 10 to 1, the news desk rang me in London and said, um, Diana's been involved in some kind of accident. We think she's all right, uh, but a man who was with her might be dead. Um, and obviously I had to get myself to London straight away. And uh, all the way up there, I was listening to the news, I was listening to, to, to the radio output, and it came via... Well, obviously, the, the, the tone changed. I, I know what happens with a royal death. I know the procedure. For the very latest monitoring all the uh, incoming wires into ITN, Tim Wilcox is in our newsroom. Let's go to him now. Well, yes, Dermot, the Press Association uh, announced with a news flash at 4.41, that's just a few minutes ago, that Diana, Princess of Wales, has died, according to British sources, uh, the Press Association learned this morning. That was followed a few minutes later by um, another report saying that Paris, Princess Diana, dead, according to an unnamed French minister. Uh, that was followed again a couple of minutes later by a doctor, again an unnamed doctor, confirming that Princess Diana was dead. It was a fast-moving story as well. Things were happening, the arrangements for, the, for Diana's body to be brought back, who was going to go to Paris. There was a lot to say. As well as Prince Charles, Paul Burrell heads to Paris to bring the princess home. I got to Paris on the first plane the next morning, around about 6 o'clock in the morning, and I was met by the British ambassador, who took me to the hospital. And um, that was a whole different scene. There were so many people. I didn't know where they all belonged, where they all came from. There were people in gowns, there were people, there were policemen, there were people in shadows. And I was just 
I was just uh, away with it. Barely three hours ago, Prince Charles arrived in a cortege at the Pitié Salpêtrière Hospital in central Paris in the British ambassador's car. He was greeted by President Chirac, flanked by the presidential guard, a rare French tribute. A sad Madame Chirac kissed on the hand by the prince. Prince Charles makes the decision to see Diana's body. And when he came out, he was white. He was white. He was literally shaken. I, I'd never seen him like that before. I'd never seen him show so much emotion before. And he suddenly realized the enormity of what had happened. Within the past few minutes, the aircraft carrying the body of Diana, Princess of Wales, has arrived at RAF North Holt in West London. She was the people's princess, and that's how she will stay, how she will remain. You know, in one of those conversations with Tony through the night, he said this thing which has stuck with me ever since. He said, this is going to produce grief on a scale we've never seen. And I thought, mm, is that right? I got picked up by a car and it was a woman driver who was crying. And I think this was the moment that I thought, oh, this is maybe going to be much, much bigger than anybody can imagine. So we got into the cars and we drove into London and then we were greeted by the most incredible sight of people on foot bridges, throwing flowers, throwing flowers on the, the ground and cars stopping and the doors opening and people just getting out on the motorway as the cortege just led its way into London. There was a long queue of people waiting to sign the Book of Condolence. And then I got out of the car and went up to a man. I remember he had a beard <laughs> and he was middle-aged. Um, and he just looked at me and burst into tears. And I thought, my gosh, this feeling is, is, is real. Um, and that was the beginning of the most extraordinary week for me and um, for the whole country, really. Behind a coffin shrouded in the royal standard and adorned by a spray of her favourite white lilies, drove her two sons, Princes William and Harry, bringing their mother back home. Diana's summer ends in tragedy. A nation unites in grief, but is left searching for answers. If there was no money, if there was no money in the photographs, they wouldn't have been after her in the tunnel. Forced to say goodbye to the people's princess. It is a point to remember that of all the ironies about Diana, perhaps the greatest was this. A girl given the name of the ancient goddess of hunting was, in the end, the most hunted person of the modern age. Here still thousands came. A royal cortege on a motorway slip road surrounded by families stacked up the banks and the bridges. In life, Diana had touched unlikely and unloved places. Today, in death, in an unremarkable urban landscape, she did the same. It's unbelievable to think that it was only a year that Diana had as a single person to do her own thing on her own two feet, and then she was gone. Well, I remember feeling a strange sort of inevitability about it, that she had had this extraordinary life, that she had had an enormous uh, impact on the world and on so many millions of people. And there was never any way in which she was going to fade away quietly. And although it was tragic that such a uh, brilliant young life should have been cut short, uh, and yet she went uh, pretty much at the height of her powers.
if there was no money in the photographs, they wouldn't have been after her in the tunnel. In your own time, gracefully. Right. No, there, there isn't going to be an announcement. There is a, there is a, there is a statement which is being faxed to the press association, but it's not going to be read out. Press association. Hold them out, love me. Almost exactly a year to the day before her death, Diana, Princess of Wales, finalises her divorce with Prince Charles. Come right out. Come on. Policemen clear the way for the princess this evening as she leaves a London hotel. Grim-faced, but £17 million richer after her divorce deal, ITN has learned authoritatively. A lot of water had gone under the bridge between Charles and Diana. All the unhappiness, all the war of the Waleses, all the book writing and the television interviews and things, all, all of that was over. Diana never wanted a divorce. Uh, she told me that when we 